My name is Stephen Appel, and uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, I work for a housing finance company. I'm, I am married with two children. And just in a way of introduction, I became a believer at the age of 12. I don't know if there are any people here who are 12 years old, but I became a believer at the age of 12. And over 30 years later, I am still loving the Lord and enjoying the Lord. Yeah. And, I, and, and, you know, just being here tonight with these young, energetic, young people, I, I, I really, it takes me back to 20 years ago when I was in a similar club at the University of Texas. And, and I have never looked back. I'm still loving the Lord tonight. I see some people I was with at the University of Texas occasionally when I'm traveling around the country. So I do hope maybe 20 years from now, some of you will also be here again visiting. All right, so um, tonight we want to continue with our series whose the title is Eternity. Eternity, 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 eternity. That's quite a big word. And I think like many times when we mention the word eternity, most of us still think in terms of time. You know, we think there's a time. And I, why do I say that? When I was, one time when I was in Southern California, I used to preach the gospel. And sometimes I would ask people, do you know what you're going to be doing in eternity? Uh, you know, maybe tell them, where will you be? Will you be with the Lord? Or where will, you won't be with the Lord? And they would be like, oh, you know, I don't care. I, what am I going to be doing for all that time? I'm like, well, no, if it's eternity, there is no time. Okay, so tonight, you're not going to be sitting around for one billion years on a cloud singing hymns. People sometimes say, what are we going to be doing for all that time? No, you can't say time in eternity. It's time. You know, that time-space concept that we have as human beings is not there in eternity. You know, it's beyond even our imagination. But tonight, we want to see the seven statuses of Christ, Christ's death. And what we want to see that from eternity past, because God had man in his heart and God loved man, he preordained Christ to go through a process so that man could be uh, reconciled to him in eternity future and be with him. And, you know, when I was trying to prepare for this message, I looked at this, it said, seven statuses of Christ's death. And I thought, because well, uh, yeah, my tongue can't wrap around the word status. I said, what is the meaning of the word status? And I thought, let me look for the meaning of the word status. And this is kind of interesting that just looking at uh, the definition of the word status, it's indicative of what man, where man's heart is today. God's heart is with man in eternity future. Man's heart is still in time. And status, okay, the first definition says the relative position standing of someone. Okay, so maybe tonight, at least in, when we're looking at Christ's seven statuses, we're looking at his relative position, the relative position of Christ's death. He took a certain position to accomplish God's purpose. But what I also found interesting is, who can give me the second definition of status? And it is very definitive of the times that we live in that shows how man has become so focused on what is happening in us, forgetting that there's going to be an eternity. What, what do you think? Who can give me? It's very common. What's a good definition of status? Nobody? Okay, well, I. Yes, place in society is very good. Man is very obsessed with his place in society. Status symbols, nice house. Car, bling bling, <laughs> you know what it got? <laughs> your jewelry and what. And that's okay, but we have to realize that what is we are, we are focused on today is not going to last, unfortunately. Sorry to disappoint you, <laughs> but that is just a fact. But one of the things I wanted to point out that, that I found very interesting in status is that it says a posting on the social network of your current situation and state of mind or opinion. Your social network status. Don't you have a Facebook status? I'm sure all of you are on the social network, right? <laughs> so I thought, now, for those who are my age, maybe 20 years ago, 
this definition of the word status did not exist. But the times that we're living in <laughs> has made it, it, made it relevant to have a new definition of the word status. People are, you know, we live in a world of digital connection, apps, social networks, allegedly to, and by the way, let me tell you something interesting. I was one of the first people on Facebook before it became a thing. <laughs> yeah, I was, and I'm not on it anymore, but, but that's okay. Um, maybe I think I was, maybe the first 1,000. I don't know. <laughs> but what, I, what I'm trying to impress upon us here tonight is that man is obsessed with his status. What am I doing? What am I not doing? But what I also found um, concerning or interesting that despite of our obsession with status symbols and what is happening in time and our social networks and how we think these networks are supposed to connect us, I found that this generation, your generation, Generation Z, 11 to 25 years old, I think that's your generation, research has shown that you, when they were asked questions, they said they are the most loneliest generation ever. They say that they're the most loneliest. They feel alone. And you think that with all the social networks and the entertainment and the distractions we have in the world, as nice as they may be, some of them, that this would be the most occupied and happiest generation. Isn't that interesting? So if you think that because of man's development and what we're doing in society today is, is, is you know, I know when you're out there, it says, oh, the world has become better, and what, you know, but yeah, and it's great. I'm not trying to say we shouldn't be on social networks or anything, but just remember that that man, his focus is on time, but God, his focus is in eternity. Um, okay, so tonight we want to look at the seven statuses of Christ, um, um, of Christ's death. What, when Christ went to the cross, when he was crucified, what were these statuses? And these statuses have, each of them are significant. Some of them had to be, do with the condition of man, some of it had to do with what God had preordained, and some of it has to do with where God wants to take man. So let's start by reading uh, the first one. The first one is, it says, the Lamb of God. Okay, so let's read that verse that John 1, 29. Amen. Okay, so Christ died as the Lamb of God. Now, of course, uh, let me back up a bit. Like, maybe some of you, you know, realize, you know, maybe you grew up in a Christian family or maybe you have seen things on TV and what, that some of you will know that Christ maybe died as the Lamb of God, a man of sin. But today we're going to also talk about some statuses that you're like, bronze serpent? Uh, peacemaker? Grain of wheat? What is this? This is all scriptural. So I, I, I don't. I hope that we'll be open tonight to see that there is each of these statuses is significant. All right. So it says the next day he who is he? Who, who is he talking about here? It says he saw Jesus coming. Who, who saw Jesus coming? John the Baptist. Okay. And he said, coming to him, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of all. Because man had sinned and fallen, uh, God had preordained that. Uh, let's read uh, Exodus 12, 3. Because what happens in what this verse is saying in John is a, a, a fulfillment of what God had ordained in Exodus. So let's read that. Speak. Okay, so in the Old Testament, when God called the children of Israel, he chose the children of Israel to be the chosen people to himself, he gave them a number of ordinances and, you know, laws, which was a portrait of himself. And one of these was, you know, to sacrifice a lamb for their sins. And in time, Jesus Christ came as this lamb to be the reality of this sacrificial lamb. And when Jesus came, 
and, um, and, and he came as the Lamb of God. The Jews were ex expecting a king to save them. And John says, behold the Lamb of God. They were thinking that for God to reconcile him, them to himself, they would send some king on a white horse who would conquer the Romans and the Persians and what, and they would become a great nation again. They didn't realize that God's way of bringing them to himself was first to deal with their sin, you know, and, 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 you know, and wash them of their iniquities. And so he first needed a lamb to reconcile them to them, to be a sacrificial lamb. These guys were looking for a, save, a savior who is a king, an outward savior. And so when John points out a lamb, and they're like, ah, who is this guy? What, what kind of, a lamb is a very meek thing that they can't even fight and save us. So they had this concept in their mind that the king would save them outwardly, you know, come blazing with guns, but apparently God's uh, ordination for salvation was a lamb. And let's read First Peter 1.19. But the precious yes. Hey, Amen. The blood of Christ is our blemish. This was God's ordination that for man's sin, man's fall, if if man wanted he needed to be reconciled to God, it had to be uh, blood without blemish, without spot. And the blood of Christ is more precious than silver and gold. Now <laughs> You know, there is a. It, 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 what is the most rare blood type in 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 uh, in 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 in, uh, in in the world? O negative. Uh, who knows? Huh? A V. No, no. Okay, yeah, yeah. Y'all, y'all need to go back to your biology class. Okay. So Christ, Christ. <laughs> Christ's blood. Okay, that, that's okay. I'll, I'll tell you guys. I'll tell you guys. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, Christ's blood is more precious than whatever. Oh, you're a nursing student. There is, and it's very precious because this is what the Lord required. And no man has that kind of precious blood. Now, in the world, there is this rare blood type called the golden blood type. It's called RH null. And apparently, there are only 53 people on earth with that type of blood as of last week when I was looking on the internet. <laughs> now, of course, you know, in, in your mind, you might be thinking, oh, this is very special. If I have this blood, I'm one of the only 53 people. Yes, but the blood of Jesus is more precious. And also, one of the problems with this blood is that if something happens to you, you will not get anyone to save you because you can't get a blood transfusion. So there's nothing really that special about it. <laughs> and if you get certain diseases, it can't be cured. <laughs> so, yeah, so apparently there is this rare type of blood, but it, does not, um, it doesn't really help you. Okay. The second said as he died, uh, Christ died was with a man without sin. Let's read that Romans 8.3. The Amen. Okay, so God sending his son in the likeness of the flesh of sin, but without sin. You know, Christ only died as a perfect man in the likeness of the flesh of sin, but he didn't have sin in him. And, and it says here, that which the law could not do. Because, you know, some, sometimes maybe as believers we think we can do something or we can be something and then we can become acceptable to God. But no, that, that's, not, that's not possible. Only those, who are, only those who are in Christ can be accepted to God. In the Bible, there's this rich young man. He comes to the Lord and he says, I've done everything. <laughs> and the Lord tells him, okay, you go and do one thing and sell all your possessions. And he went away sad because there's, nobody can be perfect. But Christ was perfect. And when we're in Christ and receive Christ, then we are acceptable to God. All right, so let's read number three. Also, as a bronze serpent, he says, and Moses, it, John 3, 14 through 15. Yes. As Moses lifted up the serpent, 
so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. Amen. And then Numbers 21, 9. How many of you had known that Christ died as, in a, in a, as a type of a bronze serpent? How many knew this before? Let's see one or two hands. When I first heard this about 20 years ago in a club, I was like, that can't be right. You are likening Christ to a serpent, the most evil. But then it's, it's there in the Bible. <laughs> and let me ask you, why do you think, of course in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is always the type, okay, of what God is, is a picture. And then the New Testament is the reality. So in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were being saved by God, going through a journey to become God's people like we are, he asked them to make a bronze serpent. And those who had been beaten, judged by the serpent, put poison in. Um, uh, when they looked up at the serpent, when it was raised up by Moses, they would be saved. So let me ask somebody real quick, can you tell me why then Christ died in the same, same type as the type of a bronze serpent? Yes. Yes, he was in the likeness. And, but also it is something about our status, our condition. Yes. Uh, who, who, I, I, no, I, somebody wants to say, I want, I want to say, yes? So yes. That he can yes, we were sinners, but every... yes, but how did we become sinners? Yes, and who deceived Adam? Adam? The serpent. The serpent. When the serpent deceived Adam, and he and Adam listened to him, he injected poison into him. So Christ has to take this likeness to destroy that gene, that, that sinful gene you have in you, not because he's a serpent, but if he wants to destroy it, he has to take that likeness. And a bronze in the Bible signifies judgment, okay? We don't have time to get into that tonight. But so he has to be judged on your behalf so that God can remove that poison, that sin from, from, from that, you know, um, yeah, Satan injected to man in the garden when, when man disobeyed God. And so, you know, in 2 Corinthians it says, Him who did not know sin, he made sin. Okay, he is God. On our behalf, that we will become the righteousness of God in him. Okay. Then, uh, let's go to 4. It says, uh, firstborn of all creation. All right, let's read Colossians 1.15. Yes, the first one of all creation. And then read the second verse, 18. Amen. So Christ, Christ is God. But having been incarnated as a man, okay, he is, and he partook of the nature of man, he became the firstborn of the new creation. Adam was in the, in the old creation. And he says, I, I think there's a verse that says, that if anyone is in the new creation, uh, then he's in Christ. So it, Adam was part of the old creation and that was fallen. But in the new creation, Christ, be, you would say, begin a new lineage, you know, a, a, a new um, um, uh, lineage that didn't have sin, the sin of life. All right, then, then five kind of bills on that it says, and uh, he's also the last Adam. The first Adam became a living soul. Okay, so, and then it says the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Okay, so the first Adam was soulish, which means he was focused on him, himself, and the nature of man. But the, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, which is, and the last Adam is Christ. When Christ died, he died to give us life and, 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 and lift man from and uplift man from his his sinful nature. All right, so let's read number six, peacemaker, Ephesians two fourteen. For he himself is our peace. He who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition. Amen. Amen. All right, so 
Christ made peace between God and man, but also he made peace between who and who? Between us and who? Because we were at enmity with some, someone, someone else. With God, but also, okay, because of time, I'll say, um, okay, so the children of Israel were God's chosen people. And we were, they, you know, they were Gentiles and the Jews. And, you know, there is, and, and the two were, you know, there's enmity between two because those were God's chosen people. But by Christ dying, he reconciled and brought those two together. So no, there's no longer any the separation that, oh, no, we are not this part of the chosen people. But, but we are in Christ, we are all uh, God's children. Uh, and, the, and he has made peace, you know, because in the Old Testament, you know, the children of Israel, they had the law, you know, and, and I think even at that time, they would despise those who did not have, circumcised. Yeah, yes, they would, you know, because they had the law and they kept the law and they looked at those who didn't have the law and say, oh, because you guys don't have God, then you, you, you know, um, you're not part of us, you're cursed. But by Christ dying on the cross, he reconciled the two. And he abolished the law of commandments and ordinances. That, that's the commandments that made a certain group of people special and others apart from God. All right. And the final one tonight is the what? Let's read that together. The grain of wind. All right. Let's read the John 12, 24. Amen. So unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And this is Christ talking about himself. Because within him, when he was a man, his life and his divine life was concealed within the shell uh, of his humanity. But when he died on the cross, he released his divine life, that we would all be able to partake of his divine life and become children of God. So this is what, because if God's intention was not just to have just this one son and one person who is saved, but he wants to have many sons, you know, and, and so, uh, and many children, you know. Um, so Christ died on the cross that he would release the life of God and be, make it available to all of us. So I, I, I would want to end here tonight and say that, um, you know, I, I, I do hope that tonight maybe we have appreciated that maybe we came tonight knowing that Jesus only died as the Lamb of God or maybe a man of sin without sin. But we have a little bit more of appreciation that there are seven statuses in which Christ died and each of those are very significant. Lamb of God because God needed a sacrificial lamb. A man without sin, he needed a perfect man. Uh, a bronze serpent because we were beaten by the serpent and we had sin in us. Uh, the firstborn of creation because the uh, new crea of creation because the old creation was was dead and old, and we needed a new creation that lives by the Spirit. The last Adam because the first Adam failed in the garden. The peacemaker to reconcile us, you know, not only with even the Jews, but you know, man is separated by a lot of things, you know, by their culture, their race, their status. And, you know, by making peace and one big, bringing in the one new man, there's no enmity between mankind. And then, of course, as a grain of weight to release the divine life that we can, when we believe into him, we can receive this life and become the many children of God. Amen. All right, I'll end right there. And, um,